Okay, here we are in the chapter on bone tissue. This is the chapter that's mostly about the physiology of bone. And the following chapter will be all about the different bones in the body as well as their features. So in this chapter, we'll look at the tissues and organs of the skeletal system, the histology of osseous tissue in a little bit more detail than we did in our chapter on tissues, how bones develop, the physiology of osseous tissue, how it actually works. It's hard to imagine bone as an actual living tissue, but it's fascinating stuff. And then we'll look at some bone disorders. So the skeletal system is composed of bones, cartilages, and ligaments that are joined tightly and form a strong, flexible framework for the whole body to be suspended within. Osteology is the study of bone. Cartilage actually is the forerunner to most bones, and it covers many joint surfaces of a mature bone. So the skeleton is actually composed of cartilage before it becomes bone. Ligaments are connective tissue that hold bones together at the joints. So ligaments are about bone to bone connections and tendons attach muscles to bone. So get those two clear, ligaments and tendons. The skeleton of course has lots of different functions. First of all, it holds the body up, supports all the muscles and allows us to chew our food by holding our teeth in place. It's definitely involved in protection. There's a nice case around our brain and the spinal cord is inside of the vertebrae. We see that the heart and lungs are protected by the ribs of the rib cage. The skeletal system allows us to move. Again, the muscles are connected to the bones and the muscles allow that movement to happen. They also are involved in electrolyte balance. Bones are a big storage site for calcium and phosphate ions. Also, they're involved in acid-base buffering because they can buffer the blood against excessive pH changes. And finally, bones are involved in blood formation. The red bone marrow is the chief producer of all the different types of blood cells. Bone, or osseous tissue, is a connective tissue with the matrix having been hardened with calcium phosphate and other minerals. So it's no longer a gelatinous matrix. It's a calcified matrix. The process of hardening the bone is called mineralization or calcification. Individual bones consist of bone tissue, bone marrow, cartilage, adipose tissue, nervous tissue, and fibrous connective tissue. Bones are continually remodeling themselves. They're actually changing all the time. And they interact physiologically with all the other organ systems of the body. We'll see how that works here shortly. If you've ever broken a bone, you'll know that they're permeated with nerves and blood vessels. And that's important if they're to be involved in our metabolic activities. So bones come in several different classical shapes. There are the long bones, which are the bones of our limbs. They're longer than they are wide, and they make rigid levers that are acted upon by the muscles to create most of the movement in our skeleton. The femur is a great example. It's the longest bone. The radius and ulna of the forearm are also long bones. Short bones are bones that are equal in length and width. Short bones are pictured here. There are things like the carpal bones and the tarsal bones or the talus in the foot. They generally glide across one another and move in multiple directions. Flat bones usually protect the soft organs. Things like the scapula or the sternum. They're often curved, but they're wide and very thin. The bones of our skull are flat bones. Irregular bones, well, that sort of describes them pretty well. They're bones of elaborate shapes that don't really fit into any of the other categories. We'll be introduced soon to the sphenoid bone in the skull and vertebrae in our vertebral column are irregular bones. So now let's look at some general features of bones. 
first of all, we're looking at a long bone over here on the right hand side. It has both compact bone and spongy bone, or dense and cancellous bone. You can see the spongy bone up here in the ends and bones, and we see mostly compact bone in this dense outer shell. The diaphysis of the bone is the main shaft of the bone. It's the cylinder of compact bone. And the epiphyses are the enlarged ends of the long bone. They're enlarged to strengthen the joint and allow attachment of ligaments and tendons. Within the bone, there's a medullary cavity or a marrow cavity. This is the space inside the diaphysis in long bones that contains the bone marrow. This is where all the blood cells are made. On the ends of the bones, we'll see articular cartilage, which is a layer of hyaline cartilage that covers the joint surface where one bone meets another and allows for a lot of slippage. The nutrient foramina are small holes in the bone surface. These foramina allow blood vessels to penetrate into and out of the bone. The periosteum is an external sheath that covers the bone, except where there's articular cartilage. If you've ever seen a dog chewing on a bone, you can see this periosteum. They peel it off. They like it a lot. The periosteum is actually composed of two layers. There's an outer fibrous layer, which is mostly collagen. Some of the outer fibers are continuous with the tendons that attach the muscles to the bone. We'll also see perforating or Sharpie's fibers. These actually penetrate the bone matrix like little hooks going into the bone to hold things like the tendons in place. This allows really strong attachment sites for muscles. The inner osteogenic layer is a layer of bone forming cells. They're really important to the growth of bone and healing of fractures. So two layers in the periosteum, the outer fibrous layer, which is mostly for attachment, and the inner osteogenic layer, which is bone forming cells. The endosteum is a thin layer of reticular connective tissue that covers the inside cavity of the bone, the medullary cavity of the bone. It has cells that help dissolve osseous tissue and then dispose of it, because the bones are constantly growing or remodeling if we're adult. We need to be able to both deposit bone and dissolve old bone. Now, between the diaphysis and the epiphyses, we'll see an epiphyseal growth plate or an epiphyseal plate. It's an area of mostly hyaline cartilage and it separates the marrow spaces of the epiphyses and diaphyses. So even though the epiphyses are made of predominantly spongy bone, there's still space in this spongy material for marrow. The epiphyseal growth plates are where we see growth in length of the bone. In adults, the epiphyseal growth plate has fused, so it forms an epiphyseal line. The bones are no longer going to grow in length after the epiphyseal plates have fused. Now, flat bones have distinctly different structure than long bones. It's more of a sandwich-like construction. We see two layers of compact bone enclosing a middle layer of spongy bone. And you can see the spongy bone looks spongy. Naturally, it isn't actually spongy in texture. It just has a spongy appearance. Both surfaces of the flat bone are going to be covered with periosteum that has the same structure as the periosteum on a long bone. The spongy layer in the cranium is called the diploe. It acts to absorb shock. Because of this layer, the skull can fracture in the outer layer of compact bone, but the diploe can absorb the impact and leave the inner layer of compact bone intact. So now would be a great time to do a little diagramming. Draw yourself a long bone and label all the different parts that you can remember. Try to do it without looking in your notes to begin with. Challenge your brain to recall as much as possible. 
It doesn't matter if you get it right or wrong to start with. Then use your notes, fill in the gaps, and come up with a complete diagram, very similar to the one here, containing all the general features of a bone, 